वेरी गुड इवनिंग टू द स्टूडेंट्स हु हैव ज्वाइन द सेशन कैन यू प्लीज राइट इन द चैट बॉक्स इफ माय वीडियो इज विजिबल द स्क्रीन द प्रेजेंटेशन एंड माय वॉइस इज क्लियर प्लीज राइट इन द चैट बॉक्स इफ इट इज ऑडिबल एंड द प्रेजेंटेशन इज विजिबल ओके थैंक यू वी विल वेट फॉर अदर्स टू जॉइन एंड देन वी विल स्टार्ट द क्लास so yeah very good evening to the students who have joined the class uh, we will start shortly uh, after uh, two or three people more join and uh, at sharp 6 pm we will start the today's session and i hope my voice is clear and um, the video the presentation all are visible if not uh, please write in the chat box
Okay, so today it is uh, yeah, it is very clear. Okay, thank you so much for the confirmation. So yeah, today it is a week three live session for this uh, NPTEL course of medicinal chemistry. So let's wait for a couple of minutes then uh, before we start. And today we will cover up our uh, week four lecture material, the topics which were uh, taught in the week four of your uh, this course. Uh, today we will uh, discuss the related questions from that week and uh, again uh, I will just uh, show you for 20 around 20 MCQs and you have to try to answer those because uh, in that way it will be better to see if you have learned uh, how, how far you have learned and if you have any problem understanding that topic and uh, just like every day if you have any query anything please write in the chat box uh, after every question I will take those queries and try to answer them and uh, I hope uh, these videos and the lecture materials are being communicated with you I think so uh, have you guys uh, get the opportunity to uh, see the videos which were uploaded last week's I think NPTEL has uh, I th uh, communicated with you with the videos and the lecture materials also and if not I will just uh, share today my uh, uh, YouTube channels uh, link playlist link so that uh, you can just uh, visit the that YouTube link and you can get through the materials ok so I think we can start <coughs> ok so again uh, I welcome you all in this uh, week 3 live session of the NPTEL course of medicinal chemistry my name is Moshumi Dev and I am a PMRF fellow from the Department of Chemistry and Chemical Biology IIT ISM Dhanbad. So this, this is the week 3 live session and in this session we will discuss the week 4 class materials of this course. Okay, so I will discuss uh, about 20 questions today and uh, after each question you yourself try to answer that question and I will uh, eventually show you the answer and I will explain that answer. So if you have any query, any doubt you can write in the chat box ok so after every question I will take those queries and I will try to answer them and anyway if I uh, skip um, any question just repeat it at the end of the session I will definitely answer uh, those questions before going so I think we can start because uh, otherwise it will take lot of time ok, okay so so the first question it says that which is the correct assignment of chirality at C2 and C3 of the following molecule. The options are like this. So this is your uh, C2 this carbon is your carbon number 2 and this is the carbon number 3 C3 and you have to find the correct assignment for these two carbons and your options are like this number A 2R 3S number B 2S 3S number C 2S 3R and number D 2R 3R. So these four are your options and you have to find out which is the correct option for this question. So take some time take 2 to 3 minutes and try to solve it before I show you the answer <coughs> sorry you can write your answer in the chat box which uh, option you think is correct and why it is uh, correct we will see eventually. So anyone uh, knows what is this projection of molecule is called? So you know there are uh, certain projections of the molecule when you are studying stereochemistry. So there are few uh, projections of the molecules how we represent that molecule. So it is one of very common and very uh, most I think used uh, way of projecting a molecule. So anybody knows uh, what is this projection of molecules called? I will see the chat box if there are any answers. Fisher projection, yes, very good. So it is the Fisher projection. Now uh, try to solve this, which is this nomenclature, uh, how this uh, configuration, which one is R, which one is S, and oh, what is the correct answer. I will let you know, I will discuss it also, but uh, try to figure out yourself first.
So this is called the Fischer projection, and if you see, this is the most common way to represent the sugar molecules, the carbohydrates, basically the glucose, fructose. These kind of carbohydrates are uh, actually okay. So we have one answer which says number A. Okay, okay. Let's uh, see what is the correct answer then. Okay, so it is correct. The correct answer is uh, number A, two R, three S. Now we have to find out why number two is R and number three is S. Okay, so let's see. So there is uh, one thing which is called. So let's go step by step. Okay. So what is R versus S configuration? So R configuration is the special arrangement of R isomer, and uh, S configuration is the special uh, arrangement of the S isomer. The R isomer has its relative direction priority order in the clockwise direction, and the S isomer has its relative direction. Of the priority order in an anti-clockwise direction. So let's uh, know what is absolute and relative configuration first. So absolute configuration in stereochemistry is the arrangement of the atoms or the group of the atoms that is desired, um, described uh, independent of any other atom uh, or group of the molecule. And the relative configuration in stereochemistry is the rearrangement of the atoms or the groups uh, that are uh, describes relative to other atoms or groups of the molecule. So the number first one is independent of the position of other substituent, and the second one is uh, relate uh, depends on the position of uh, actually other substituent, and the first one we can uh, use uh, the um, the designation as R and S, and cis trans E Z. These designations are used for the relative configuration. So the when I say absolute configuration, it comes for the R and S. So th in this Fischer projection, now we have to understand. Which one will be R and which one will be S? So first we know, need to know what is the priority. So the priority order of these two molecules, if you say, so this is your number two. So the groups attached to it is this aldehyde group, this OH group, this hydrogen group, and this whole moiety. So with this carbon number two, these four moieties are they are at attached. Now you have to find out what is the priority of these groups. Okay. So priority means you have to see like uh, see we can say like like molecular weight, okay. So like oxygen has uh, this carbon is attached to oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, and this is uh, this is also a carbon. So since oxygen has the higher molecular weight, so it will be prior one. So your priority one will be for this OH group. Now the second priority. Now if you see that this carbon it is attached with one hydroxyl group, one hydrogen, and one CH two OH group. And this carbon it is attached with one hydrogen and one oxygen molecule. Okay, so priority wise, this will be your number priority number two. This carbon will be priority number two with respect to this carbon, and this num this will be your this group will be your priority number three, and hydrogen will be always priority number four. So as you can see, if you go from one, two, and then three, if you go like this, so this is clockwise rotation. Okay. And since it is one, two, and three, it is your clockwise rotation. Now it will be then it will be your R configuration, right? So this is your R configuration for the clockwise <laughs> rotation. Okay. Now one more thing about this uh, R and S configuration, which I will it will be better if I show you first. Okay. So there is a thing uh, called CIP rules. Okay. So what is the CIP rules? The CIP rule for placing the one second. Somebody has wanted to join. Hmm. So the CIP rule, it actually takes care of this. Yeah. So if you see the CIP rule, just I uh, said you about the priority. So the CIP rules call for the placing the number four priority group in the back, and then tracing the path of one, two, three. Now if you say that this is the new year. Uh, New Fischer projection, and these two groups are uh, your so pointing toward you. Okay, because it is the bold. So here the group of the priority number four is uh, in the front, which is in the wedge, uh, wedge form. Okay, instead of rotating the molecule to put the four back, just trace the path of one, two, three, and reverse the result. <coughs> so you have to in this case, this is the group. The chlorine is the priority one. The CH two Br group it has priority number two. And this has the priority number three. This carboxylic acid. Okay. Now, if you go from one, two, and three, then it is the clockwise zero rotation. Okay, means the R rotation. But since it this hydrogen is in uh, wedge form, okay, 
so this chiral center will be s okay so the 99 percent cases when the number for substituent on the fissure is h it will be one of the side groups okay on the wedge so uh, the reverse rule is applied in more in more or less cases okay now if you see the for this carbon we have to then assign the priority okay so for this case what will happen this group you have this have priority number one okay so this is priority number one and this group has priority number two this one okay and this is has the priority number three and it is one two and three and since it is again in the wedge formation so it will be your three s okay so it will be r and it will be s so that is how the RS nomenclature it comes and uh, actually there are many configurations and many way of projection of molecule and this R and S nomenclature is uh, something which is uh, sometimes confusing but if you practice so it will be very easy okay. And actually this is uh, this uh, stereo this is uh, more part of a stereo chemistry not much of your uh, part of the medicinal chemistry but if you know the medicinal there are something called chiral drugs and the enantiomers because in the drugs if there are chiral centers so it must be of a single enantiomer to have a effect and we will gradually see uh, like uh, how it is uh, related to your stereochemistry and your medicinal chemistry how these are related okay so now uh, we will go to our problem number 2 okay so one thing okay okay so there is a thing called aldehyde have will have the higher priority so i actually i also am uh, have a doubt in this case because the aldehyde group there is and there is uh, another group which has this uh, hydroxyl oh or attached to it this is uh, another higher molecular weight so in that case yeah i think it is uh, you are correct like this aldehyde will have more higher for priority so it will be two and it will be three so we will go like 1, 2 and 3 which is anti-clockwise and if we reverse it, it will be your configuration number R. So like this I have like said that uh, there are many ways of projecting the molecules and there are many ways to uh, ways of doing it. Okay, so yeah, so there is one thing which I also did the mistake like this aldehyde group will have the higher priority. Okay, the aldehyde group will be have priority 2. Okay, so there is a something called a priority chart and uh, you can find it in any uh, stereochemistry book like in the Fisher projection uh, how while doing the artist nomenclature which group will have higher priority and which group will not ha have higher priority. Now one more thing you have to uh, remember like if you have hydrogens like in the Fisher projection so this is like the Fisher projection right. So if the hydrogen is in this side either right or either left then uh, the result whatever we you will get you get from this uh, rotating the ball the priority order you have to just reverse it okay like here we have the priority like for this number two carbon we have one we have two and we have three so one two and three if we go like this this is anti-clockwise means your uh, this configuration it will be r since because only because the hydrogen is in the in, uh, pointing towards you in the wedge formation okay and then um, say in last in the next one the similarly it will have like this it is one it is 2 and it is 3 so it is the clockwise direction so it should be r but uh, since it is reverse so it will be s that is how we get the results like uh, 2 r and 3 s and now I think it is clear because it you may have doubt in this all again so if you have again doubt you can write Yeah, just uh, I have uh, told you like in the CIP rule it says that the atoms bonded with the carbon will have higher priority like higher atomic number it is correct but there is another thing like there is another rule about the groups okay. So there is a little confusion about this two thing two rules and uh, I will again uh, actually try to find out more clear answer of this question because uh, there is something uh, confusing in about it okay. So there is something is higher uh, molecular weight will have higher priority or any other rule exists there because these two are little contradictory okay. So next day I will try to find out uh, more concrete answer for this RS nomenclature from a uh, of I mean more high stereochemistry book okay. I will remember this problem number one and uh, I will try to figure out which one will be more correct okay. Yeah okay it will be better if I will uh, see any uh, good uh, stereochemistry book about this uh, to clear this confusion okay. 
So, okay, I will remember this problem number 1 and I think now we can move to our problem number 2. So, problem number 2 it says that which of the following terms is used to describe a drug that binds to a receptor, fails to activate it and prevents the endogenous chemical messengers from binding. Number A, agonist. Number B, partial agonist. Number C, antagonist. And number D, inverse agonist. So, you have to find out which of the following terms is used to describe the drug which binds to a receptor, fails to activate it and prevents the endogenous chemical messenger from binding. Is it agonist? It, is it partial agonist? Is it antagonist or inverse agonist? So, do we have any answer for num problem number 2? Okay, so I have one answer number C. So, let us see. Okay, so the correct answer for this problem is yes, very good, it is number C, the antagonist. So, do you remember what is agonist and what is antagonist as uh, we discussed it in the previous class also I think. So, okay, so agonists are the drugs that occupy the receptors and activate them, okay. But antagonists are the drugs that occupy the receptors but do not activate them. They actually block the receptor activation by the agonist, okay. So, as you can see this is a good representation, okay. So, there is a agonist versus antagonist thing uh, which is written here, I will just come to that thing later. So, um, this is uh, if it, this is a receptor and this is a receptor binding area. So, this is the agonist molecule. The when the agonist molecule binds to the <coughs> receptor, it will activate the receptor, okay. And we will have this uh, uh, which is called the chemical messenger thing, it will happen and the full activation will happen when the agonist is binding to the receptor. Now, the antagonist is that drug or that chemical compound that if it binds to the activation side there of the receptor, there will not be any activation. So, you can see if an antagonist is binding, so there is no activation, okay. And if the agonist and antagonist are trying to bind the same receptor partially, then there will be a less activation, okay. So, the, in the question it is uh, said that the drug that binds to the receptor but fails to activate it. So, it is the antagonist because the antagonist bind to the receptor but it does not activate the receptor just like the agonist do. So, there is a agonist versus antagonist uh, chart here. So, the agonist produces an action or response and the antagonist it produces an opposite action or response. Okay. Agonist is a muscle whose contraction uh, moves a part of the body directly, but the antagonist is a muscle whose action contra um, counteracts that of the agonist. Agonist is a substance which uh, in initiates the uh, physi physiological response when combined with a receptor and antagonist is a substance that uh, interferes with uh, or inhibits the uh, physiological action of another. Okay. So, agonist is a drug which uh, emulates the action of neurotransmitter in the brain and antagonist is a drug that blocks the neurotransmitter. Agonist is the leading character of uh, rework and antagonist is the main opposite force of the protagonist. So, these are various uh, I think uh, examples uh, of the I can say uh, agon of, of uh, what agonist and what antagonist do. Okay, so, just to remember this two term and I think I last uh, class I also discussed what is the partial agonist, what is the inverse agonist. You can just go back to that slide and there is a chart of uh, in detail what is agonist, what is antagonist, what is partial agonist and what is uh, inverse agonist. All of the those are written in that previous day slide and uh, I hope uh, these uh, slides and videos are have been communicated to you because I get a, uh, I got a mail from the PMRF uh, sorry I, from the NPTEL side that they have uh, shared this uh, videos and the slides of the previous classes. So, if you uh, go to the SWAM website and uh, check it there, I think they have started uploading the recorded videos of our classes and the presentations are also given there. So, in, in any case if you miss anything during the class uh, due to the internet connection or in, uh, anything, you can just go back, click on that link and you will get here. Okay. 
and after today's class I also will uh, share the YouTube playlist uh, link for uh, our class this class I have a YouTube playlist uh, where I upload these videos every week uh, so I will share it uh, to you after today's class in any case if you are not getting it from the NPTEL website you can uh, check it from there okay okay so anybody has any doubt in this question if not then we will move to our next problem So let's see what is the problem number three. Okay, so the problem number three it says that the structure for the compound is shown below. Okay, so this is the structure for the compound. So which of the structure is different from the following? So you have to find out this is the structure and which of the following four structures is different from this structure. Okay, so this is not marked as A, B, C, D. So just to let us, uh, I think you can understand which is A, this is A, this is B, this is C and this is D and you have to find out which of the following is different from this one this is the normal form of the cyclohexane and uh, if it is projected in the chair from which will be uh, which will not be actually uh, matching with this you have to find out Do we have any correct answer for this? Okay. Okay, so okay, let's see what is the correct answer and how do we actually convert these things. Okay, so the correct answer is I think it is number B. Okay, so number B is the correct answer means number B structure is different from the structure it is shown here. Okay, so now how you will uh, un understand how it is uh, projected and uh, how it is converted. Okay. So, this is the chair conformation of the cyclohexane as we all know because it looks like chair uh, if you can correlate with this and this. So, you can see it is kind of looking like chair. So, it is the chair form of the cyclohexane which is the most stable one. Okay. okay somebody wants to join. Okay. So, since it is the chair form of the cyclohexane. Now, it is a normal uh, this is the normally how we write the cyclohexane but in the uh, original in the actually in the nature the cyclohexane stays mostly like this like this molecule ok. So, how we uh, actually convert this uh, things ok. So, as you can see uh, like uh, this uh, um, bold bond it uh, signifies upward and this uh, dashed bond it is signified the downward ok and in the cyclohexane there are uh, many kinds of bonds. So, this red ones is this is these are called the axial bonds and the blue ones these are called the equatorial bond. And if you can see there are red bonds which are uh, this axial bonds and this equatorial bonds can be upward and downward also. So, if these, uh, these are this, uh, this one, this, this one and this one ok. So, these three are pointing upward. So, this will be if uh, we convert this to this. So, it will be bold like this and these axial bonds here this one, this one, this one and this one. So, these three are pointing downward. So, it will be like dashed ok. So, this uh, this is the three uh, axial bonds are pointing upward and three axial bonds are pointing downward. Same the equatorial bonds. So, if it is pointing like this, if it is pointing like this I mean this one you can see it is pointing like upward. So, it will be also like bold and uh, this is point this hydrogen is pointing this hydrogen is pointing downward. So, it will be like dashed ok. So, if you can see from here if you look at this example 
if this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and 6 the carbons and if you represent this in this chair formation. So now for with number 1 carbon you have 1 uh, OH which is upward directing upward. So this is your number 1 carbon. In this carbon we have only 2 bonds 1 uh, equatorial and 1 axial. Since your equatorial bond is facing upward so there we will have this OH like this ok. And in this uh, number 3 carbon we have then again axial and equatorial and since the axial bond it is pointing downwards so this chlorine will be here ok. So you understand how this is uh, this upward and downward thing goes. Now if you carefully look at this one so if we uh, like uh, name it like 1 then it is 2 then it is 3 it is 4 this 5 and this 6 ok you can take anyone as 1 then that does not matter. Now if you uh, see like in 1 and 2 carbon this 2 carbons have 2 methyl group CH3 group yeah, methyl group ok. So if you see carefully like in every projection there are 2 carbons adjacent ok. So let us check it out. So here if we can uh, if we, you correlate it so this is this will be your 1 this will be your 2 this will be 3 this will be 4 ok. Let us uh, not take uh, care of 5 and 6 because that does not have any uh, substituent. So you can see carefully like with 1 the methyl group it is below the plane. So if you can see in the A option so this methyl is below the plane with 1 carbon and number 2 carbon the methyl is upward the plane ok. So you can see this is up to the plane and in number 4 the methyl group is up to the plane which is here the number 4 it is up to the plane. So these two are same ok. Now if you can uh, see carefully number B so it this is similar 1 it is 2 it is 3 and it is 4. So with number 1 the methyl group is below the plane number 2 the methyl group is up the plane but in the number 4 the methyl group is below the plane. So it should be dashed ok but here we have a number 4 methyl group up the plane. So this is incorrect. Now if you see carefully if we can say it is 1, it is 2 because this 2 adjacent methyl group, it is 3 and it is 4. So look at carefully the number 1 methyl is uh, below the plane, in number 2 it is up the plane and in the number 4 also it is up the plane. So it is also the same and in case of this one we can say it is your uh, number 1, this is 2, this is 3 and this is 4. Again it is below the plane, up the plane, up the plane like below the plane, up the plane, up the plane. So this one also similar to this one. So that is how we correlate to the two structures like uh, if it is given like uh, this how you convert it in the chair form and how the bonds will be like this ok. So this is a little uh, tricky if you do are not used to seeing the cyclohexanes and everything with the stereochemistry so it is a bit it, but uh, you can actually uh, read any good stereochemistry book there are a couple of uh, stereochemistry book and uh, you will see there are uh, this things very common. So I think do you, did you understand this question or uh, do you have uh, anything uh, which you did not understand then I have to repeat it. Uh, so if you do not understand anything in this question please uh, tell me then I will repeat it ok. Ok somebody has raised the hand ok. So you can write in the chat box uh, if you did not understand it. Okay, so not uh, bonds coming toward the observer. So if you can see if okay, so there is a thing I will just draw it out. So, okay, so let's say you are uh, you have a question if this is bond coming toward the observer. So technically no. Actually, if you can see uh, this is a cyclohexane molecule very carefully. <coughs> so see there is a cyclohexane molecule. Let's say uh, this cyclohexane molecule. So if you can imagine a plane. Okay, here. So this carbon, this carbon, this carbon and this carbon you if you there is a uh, if you can just uh, imagine a plane here ok this 4 carbon this one, this one, this one and this one. This 4 carbon if you uh, think it there is a plane here ok so uh, should I draw it I do not know. So if you say this is your cyclohexane molecule ok. So this drawing is very bad but uh, let us uh, try to figure out. So if you can uh, imagine a plane here ok in the which is cutting this molecule in the half. So if the bonds are uh, pointing upward to that plane and uh, so it will be bold and if the bonds are uh, pointing downward to the plane so it will be your dashed ok. So it is a little bit uh, problematic to 
show you here but uh, if you can imagine the taking care of this four molecules so this one this two this three and this four i if i can just uh, erase this okay i don't know so if you can uh, see so if you this take care of this carbon this carbon this carbon and this carbon if you see just don't take uh, these two carbons just take this four carbon and uh, imagine there is a plane okay. so if there is a plane so the bonds which are uh, up, uh, facing upward to that plane it will be bold and the bonds which are facing downward to that plane it will be dashed and this is a little difficult to draw it like and uh, show you here this is the problem of the stereochemistry and uh, so just uh, tell me did you understood uh, how what i uh, just uh, told you right now like why it is bold and why it is rash you have to just uh, imagine a plane and the bonds which are facing the plane upward to the plane it will be bold and the bonds which are facing downward it will be your so it will be your dashed yeah okay very good and uh, this is the problem with the stereochemistry i think the stereochemistry things cannot be taught in the online properly but i will try uh, try my best if you i can just uh, help you so that's how we come mm, like this you have to just imagine a plane and the bonds which are pointing upward to that plane it is the bold and the bonds which are facing downward it will be your uh, dashed so in every carbon actually the hydrogens if you can see here like uh, in every point it is uh, there is a one upward axial bond downward uh, uh, equatorial bond in the next one it will be reverse there, there will be upward uh, equatorial bond downward axial bond then again it will be upward axial downward equatorial that's how it goes okay so today I, whatever i will do at the end of the session i will uh, suggest you few books on the stereochemistry where you can uh, just learn these things better okay well, i think stereochemistry is not a part of this course but yeah it is related to the medicinal chemistry in a very large uh, to uh, some large extent so it will be better if you have a, uh, i mean good concept of stereochemistry also okay so at the end of the session i will uh, suggest you a couple of books where you can just find these things and you read these things better okay so i will move toward our next problem number problem number 4 so it says that which of the following types of compound is uh, a proof for the following statement a compound can be a chiral yet still it can have chiral carbons so the options are number a epimers number b enantiomers number c meso compounds and number d diastereomers so i think this is a uh, this is uh, easier question okay so if the compound can be achiral yet it can have chiral carbons you have to find out which type of compounds these are so you can write in the chat box the answer okay so i have one answer number d so anybody who wants to try we have C, D, C, D. Okay, so there are two questions, uh, two I think options. Everybody has said C, either C or D. So let's quickly see the answer of that question because we have to move forward. Okay, so correct answer is number C, meso compounds. Okay, so diastereomers are uh, something different. We will come to that part later. So the uh, meso compounds are actually these are achirals. Okay, the meso compounds. Uh, but uh, it has carb chiral carbons and diastereomers are something different it uh, may not have uh, the diastereomers uh, may not be uh, achiral so there is uh, no correlation between the diastereomerism and the chirality so these are two different concepts we will come to that part also later you might get confused in these things so yeah so these are the few categories of the compounds okay so as you can see this is a very good concept very good um, uh, uh, example so this is so there is a chiral center here there is a chiral center here so these two carbons are chiral okay because these carbons are bonded with four different uh, groups but you can see there is a mirror plane in between this molecule since there is a mirror plane in the between this molecule this molecule will be a chiral so uh, these are the uh, different uh, molecules this uh, molecule is chiral a chiral and meso 
So, the definition the chiral carbons, chiral compounds are the have uh, tetrahedral carbon bonded to four different groups. Uh, okay. So, the chiral compounds are uh, those where the tet tetrahedral carbon bonded to at least two same groups. Okay. And the mesa compounds, the compounds who have two or more chiral centers. So, the for the optical activity, the chiral carbons are optically active, the chiral and the mesa compounds are optically inactive. So, for the mirror imaging, So, for the mirror imaging part, so the chiral compounds have uh, non superimposable mirror images. So, achiral carbons have superimposable mirror images and meso compounds also have superimposable mirror images. <coughs> the plane of symmetry in the um, chiral com compounds, there is no plane of symmetry. In the achiral compounds, there is plane of symmetry present and in the um, meso compounds, there are plane of symmetry present inside the molecules. And you can see the examples here in this uh, forms. You can see there is example of this chiral, achiral, and meso compounds. And so there is one more thing which is called the racemic mixture and meso compounds. These two terms are very much similar. So the racemic mixture is a compound of organic uh, compounds, a mixture of organic compounds who, uh, who are, are known as enantiomers. And the meso compound is a molecule having more than one identical <coughs> stereo centers and an identical or superimposable mirror image. So, in the racemic mixture, it contains uh, non identical isomers, and uh, in the meso compounds, it contains identical mirror images. And uh, the racemic mixture, it contains chiral compounds, but uh, these compounds are considered to be achiral. So, actually, the racemic mi mixture say you have uh, 50 molecules of R isomer and uh, 50 molecules of S isomers. So, this R isomers and S isomers molecules, they are itself, these molecules are chiral. But the mixture, this 50-50 mixture, this uh, amount, this 50-50 mixture makes this whole compound, uh, I mean optically inactive, which is called the racemic mixture. So, one optical rotation is uh, counter attacked by another, um, uh, another optical rotation. But the meso compounds, these compounds are the compounds which are have chiral centers, means these compounds, this in these molecules, there are chiral carbons, but there is a in, in, in inherent this plane of symmetry present. That is why it is a chiral of a whole. So, as you can see there is a mirror image and this mirror plane. So, in this mirror plane is uh, because of this mirror plane this molecule is a chiral. Okay, in the Fisher projection you can actually see it better. This is also a Fisher projection kind of. So, let us say there is H, there is OH, there is uh, methyl, there is a methyl and the very uh, common example is like tartaric acid you have, have you uh, I think you have heard of meso tartaric acid it is very common example of the meso compound so and uh, one more thing the diastereomer is something different okay so the, some people have the confusion of this diastereomer and being a chiral and everything so i will say i will just come to the diastereomer part later that this is a different thing okay okay so i think uh, this is uh, fine i will just now go to the next problem so, problem number 5, it says that which of the following terms is used to describe the concentration of a drug required to produce a measurable effect of 50 percent of the animal tested. Is this uh, EC 50, number B is LD 50, number C is IC 50 and number D is EC 99. So, you have to find out which term describes the concentration of a drug required to produce 50 percent of the uh, measurable effect in the animal tested. Try to answer this question, then I will uh, just uh, give a brief about all these terms, uh, what all these terms uh, means in the drug discovery. And these terms, uh, let me tell you, these are very important uh, when you are start uh, studying medicinal and uh, learning about this uh, everything. So, these terms are very important actually. Anybody wants to answer this question, you can write in the chat box. check out if I have any answer for it. Okay, we have A, 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 A. Okay, the structure gained by ring flipping is the same compound, right? Yeah, uh, for uh, I think uh, you are asking for the meso one, so it will be same compound. Okay, so 
we have uh, many options and most of the people are saying it is number A. So let us check out. Okay, yeah. So the correct answer is number A. So this is something it is called the drug responsive curve. Okay. So if you uh, just uh, take a uh, in the x axis we are taking the log of the dose. So dose is like uh, the concentration you can say uh, of the drugs like uh, micromolar, nanomolar this kind of concentration and if you plot with this response, response means how now this response can be anything. Okay. Like uh, let me say like in case of like inhibitors. So this uh, like um, the response is basically the uh, I think uh, if you do the cell cultures thing like this is it is the viability of the cell. It means you are uh, have some uh, certain number of cells in a uh, in a uh, plate and uh, if you add some compound. So after a time the, if the cells die or there is any other uh, response so that thing we will plot in the y axis ok. So the EC50 is called the median effective dose. So is it is um, so or ED50, EC50. So what is uh, it is this C and D? Don't get confused in it. So both are both are uh, more or less same. Okay, so do D for uh, we can say it is as a dose and uh, C is uh, stands for the concentration and both are uh, uh, used in the same uh, thing. Okay, so there is one more thing which is called the therapeutic index. So I have uh, given it uh, here because I think this is uh, related with this uh, kind of the words. Okay. So the therapeutic index is the ratio between the dosage of a drug causes a toxic effect or lethal effect and the doses cause the therapeutic effect. Okay. So the toxic effect or therapeutic effect it will be in the new, um, numerator and the effective drug concentration or doses uh, 15 so it will be in the uh, numerator denominator. So, okay. so ED50 or EC50 is the dose or the concentration of a drug which produces a therapeutic effect of the 50 percent. So as you can see if there is response is 50 percent and if you extrapolate this up to your dose responsive curve and if you then just draw perpendicular on the x axis the dose which we will find from this point from the x axis is it will be your EC50 value. So EC50 basically it is stand for the effective concentration for 50 percent of the population effect okay and there is uh, the term ld50 and this ld50 means the the lethal uh, the doses or uh, the the dose or the concentration which is lethal to 50% of the population and one more thing there is called the ic50 and ic50 is actually inhibitory concentration of 50% now you are trying to inhibit something inhibit inhibit any response so now the concentration of the drug which is needed to inhibit a certain con uh, certain thing in our body up to 50 percent it is called the EC50 value and EC99 is same thing same thing as the EC50 but it will produce the 99 percent of the effective um, response okay. So if you say it is your uh, 99 uh, it is if it is 50 okay for EC50 it is 50 percent and on the y axis and it is if it is 99 percent on the y axis. Uh, you have to similar way to plot it this thing and you will get the EC99 value from this drug responsive curve. Okay. Uh, so the in this drug responsive curve, so this dose can be of uh, any concentration like micromolar, nanomolar, millimolar and this response can be anything if uh, it is something inhibition kind of uh, mechanism happens. So it will be the cell viability percentage and if it is response then it will be something other. So what we will plot uh, it depends and it uh, changes from drug to drug from the experiment to experiment. So I think it is clear. Okay. So if it is uh, clear I will move toward our next problem. Okay, so problem number 6 it says that shown below is the chemical compound for penicillin a common prescription drug. Okay. And how many of chiral um, carbons do penicillin have? So this is the representation of the penicillin molecule. You have to find out how many chiral carbons are present in this penicillin molecule. So the options are like A, B, A, uh, number 4, B, 3, C, 2 and D, 5. So how many chiral carbons are present in the penicillin? Find out. And this penicillin is a certain kind of drug. So anybody knows uh, how, uh, which category of drug it uh, falls? I mean which type of drug it is the penicillin
yeah it is antibiotic yeah it is beta lactam antibody very good so find out now uh, how many chiral carbons are there in the penicillin look at the uh, molecule very carefully and then answer this We have only one answer. I want uh, others also to answer this question. So, how many of the chiral carbons are there? Okay, so I will show you. So, correct answer is number B3. Now, there are three chiral carbons in here present. This uh, star mark, this, um, this uh, actually denotes the, which is the chiral center. So, two chiral centers are uh, very easy to notice like uh, number the, this one. As you can see, there is a bold, uh, this dashed bond and this one also. So, these two are very easy to notice, I think this one and this one. Now, this is also a chiral center, okay. If you can see like this carbon, it is bonded with four different groups. So, first bond is with sulfur, second bond is with nitrogen, third bond is with carbon and the fourth bond which is not shown here, it is hydrogen, okay, which is not drawn here. So, there is a hydrogen present. So, this carbon is also chiral and as you can see, this is also because this, uh, this group, this group and this group also are different and there is a hydrogen present which is not shown here and this also have a hydrogen present which is not shown. Okay, so when uh, you are given some chemical structure and you have to find out uh, is uh, it is chiral or not, just look at the structure carefully because in most of the cases the hydrogens are not drawn. Okay, you have to think and you have to figure out where the hydrogens will be and then you have to mark. Okay. Okay, so I think it is clear you do not have problem understanding this okay and quickly I will move toward our next problem okay so the problem number seven it says that which of the following statements is not true regarding the chair cyclohexane number a dihedral angle of two axial bonds on adjust carbons are 180 degree Number B, dihedral angle between two equatorial bonds on the adjust carbon is 60 degree. Number C, the axial hydrogens atoms on the C1 and C2, uh, C1, C3, C5 of the equatorial are equilateral triangle. And option D, dihedral angle between axial bond and equatorial bond on adjacent carbons are 60 degree. Now, let us figure out which of the following uh, statements is not true about uh, chair cyclohexane. Again, I uh, just uh, in uh, pre previous one question, I uh, show you the chair from a cyclohexane, how the axial bonds and how the equatorial bonds looks like. Okay, so just recapitulate that and uh, try to figure out which of the following statement is not true. Anyway, I will show you the answer and I will also try to draw it. Uh, I think uh, it is a little difficult to draw it here, but uh, still I will try to draw it and. Uh, make you understand how the angles looks like how it is a thing so you remember right uh, how the chair form of the cyclohexane looks i will try to draw it but i don't think i will able to draw it very good manner so the chair form is like this and the bonds like this is axial, this is equatorial, here it is equatorial, it is axial, okay. Just so, let us just draw this two, four bonds because if I draw other bonds, it will be mm, little difficult. So, you have to, so you have four, this is your axial bond, this is your axial bond, this is your equatorial bond, this is your equatorial bond. So, the bonds which are uh, moving, I think upward, downward, I have said, which is bold, which is waged, I have uh, told you in the in some question last time so okay anybody wants to answer it 
we have one answer number D okay so let us check out the answer because it will take time to make you understand this thing little, this is a little bit tricky okay so correct answer is D so correct in that sense the dihedral angle between actual equatorial bond on the adjacent carbon is 120 degree this statement is not true about the chair cyclohexane so first let's see what is the dihedral angle so the dihedral angle basically between angle between two planes so if you can say this is a kind of book shape uh, thing so this angle between this plane alpha plane and this beta plane it is called the dihedral angle okay so if you see a molecule uh, in this uh, formation so this is the uh, how this dihedral angle uh, torsion curve goes okay so don't um, so this is in this projection uh, if you uh, represent the cyclohexane molecule we can represent the cyclohexane molecule in this projection also okay uh, so in this newman projection we can uh, just uh, I mean it is a little difficult to represent but we can and if you do represent it it will be easier for you to see how the uh, this angles goes like okay so this is as you can see this is the Newman projection of the chair form of the cyclohexane okay now how this projection comes like uh, it is little difficult to you uh, make you understand from this uh, I think online class and by this pre -tweet then again I have said uh, that I will just suggest uh, good books of the stereochemistry at the end of the session in that books these things are very clearly uh, actually uh, understood uh, clearly written okay so so let's see this thing carefully okay if you see this thing carefully uh, so this carbon and this carbon okay uh, I will just mark it here so this carbon this carbon and this carbon so these two carbons are drawn like this okay this and this so uh, we have uh, two, two carbons are just uh, be behind this carbons so this carbon these two carbons which are just behind this carbon are this and this which is not shown here okay and this carbon is number this carbon and this carbon this below carbon it is this carbon so if you just uh, put, put some names uh, numbering so if you say it is one it is two it is three it is four it is 5 and it is 6 so if you go like this this one will be number 1 okay and this one will be number 5 and joining 1 and 5 there is a carbon which is below joining 1 and 5 this is number 6 okay behind the number 1 carbon there is number 2 carbon which is not shown here and behind the number 5 there is number 4 carbon which is not shown here also and 2 and 4 these are joined by number 3 which is upward which is here okay so this is number 3 so that's how this is goes so if you can see carefully so this is uh, like uh, the hydrogens uh, here it is mentioned how the hydrogens goes like this so if you just uh, give it upward downward so it will be like this okay I think it is a little bit uh, difficult to understand but uh, you have to just uh, project these things yourself okay uh, you have to read it from the book and then try it yourself to understand how the bonds goes like okay so the first uh, see the first uh, option so we will now go to option by option so it says that the dihedral angle um, of the two axial bonds of adjacent carbon is 180 degree so it is actually easy to understand so see this carbons okay this carbon and this carbon these two carbons one and two these are adjacent carbon right so there are two axial bond this axial bond and this is also axial bond now what is the angle between these two bonds it is you can see these both are just opposite to each other so it will be 180 degree so it is correct okay this option is correct now number two it says that the dihedral angle between two equatorial bonds of adjacent carbon is 60 degree so this is a equatorial bond and this is another equatorial bond and the angle between these two is 60 degree and it is actually if you see from here it is very easy to understand from here okay so as you can see there is okay there is two bonds are missing here so you can see this this uh, adjacent carbon this carbon is one carbon and the carbon behind which is not shown here this is another carbon and the two axial bonds this is one axial bond this is another axial bond and both of them has an angle of 180 degree okay and this is one adjacent carbon equatorial bond this is another equatorial bond and the angle between two is one to end uh, sorry 60 degree okay and the last option so the, there is number three it says that the axial hydrogens of one three and five form a equilateral triangle so there is uh, this is one 
this is 3 and this is 5. So, this uh, carbons ok they form a equilateral triangle which is also a correct answer ok and uh, number 4 it is the incorrect. So, the dihedral angle between axial equatorial bond on adjust carbons it not it is not 120 degree ok. So, you can see the adjacent carbon there is one axial bond and there there is another equatorial bond. So, this angle between these two it is actually your 60 degree. So, it is not your 120 degree. So, it is incorrect ok. This the angle between this bond and this bond ok. So, angle between these two bonds are 60 degree it is not 120 degree. I do not know if you I could uh, make you understand this thing because it is a pretty um, so ok. So, there is uh, ok. So, it is actually not 90 degree I, I do not think it is 90 degree ok if you can look uh, if you look carefully. So, the angle between this and this it is not 90 degree ok. So, this is the axial bond right and uh, this is the equatorial bond in the adjacent if you can see here. I will show you if you see it carefully. So, it is if it is axial bond this bond is your axial bond on one carbon ok and the adjacent carbon equatorial bond is here. So, the angle between these two it is not 90 degree it is around 60 degree we can say ok. So, anyway you can just uh, read it from any book I will uh, I have said like this things are cannot be uh, make you understand with this only one ppt one slide. Okay, so, I will just share the name of the stereochemistry books you can read it from there. So, anyway ok. So, now I will move toward the next problem and if you do not understand this problem just you write can write in the chat box at the end of the session I will try to uh, explain it once more ok. I know this things are little uh, difficult and uh, but uh, still I will try to make you understand ok. So, next uh, move to our, our next problem. So, the next problem it says that which of the following is not crucial requirement of a drug to act as an agonist. Number A functional groups, number B size, number C metabolic stability and number D pharmacophore. So, you have to find out which is not a crucial requirement for a drug to act as an agonist. Try to answer this question then I will uh, move I will just show you the answer and we will discuss it. But first you try to answer this. So, that is how if you try to answer I will just uh, you also will understand which parts do you need help in this course and everything. Ok, so do we have any options answers for this question? Ok, so numbers so miss most of the answers are like C ok. So, let us see which is the answer. Ok, so the correct answer is number C. So, agonist as I have uh, said it uh, like uh, before like agonist are they determine the um, efficiencies of the molecule in the dose responsive curves and functional groups and <coughs> to determine the uh, relative uh, potencies in other subtype receptors. They determine relative dependence uh, of the potency. So, this is a textured profile for a agonist molecule ok. So, as you can see uh, the crucial requirement for a drug to act as an agonist it is not the metabolic stability ok. Because the metabolic uh, stabilities can be actually enhanced by very much matters like change of the attaching sized uh, deuterization, uh, changing chirality. 
cyclization, introducing isosteric groups, introducing heteroatoms, incorporating halogen atoms. So, these are the some uh, things which are metabolic stability enhancement it can happen like this and this is a textured uh, profile for the agonist molecule. Okay. So, functional groups are very crucial requirement for a drug to be an agonist. So, it be because of the changing of the functional group can change the uh, interaction which is the receptor drug interaction. So, functional groups are very important. Size is also very important because uh, you know agonist molecules are binds to the receptor size. Okay. But if it does not fit in the receptor site, it will not act as an agonist. So, size is also very important. Metabolic stability is one thing which is not that much important. Uh, but the pharmacophore is also very important and uh, so somebody has raised your hand so you can just write in the chat box what is your query okay okay so i will just uh, say what is pharmacophore so pharmacophore is a per crucial part of a drug molecule so if you can see there is a drug molecule so in that drug molecule there will be a group okay which is very important for the uh, activity of that drug so, which is called the pharmacophore. Later in the course, we will discuss more about the pharmacophores. Mm, okay, so you don't have to uh, about think about it right now. So, somebody has raised the hand. So, if you have any query, you can write in the chat box if you don't understand this problem or uh, this answer. So, you can just write in the chat box. So, quickly we will move to our next problem. So, the problem number 9, it says that which of the statement regarding the drug thalidomide is true? So, number A, R isomer is sedative, number B, S isomer is sedative, number C, both R and S isomers can be used as drug and number D, R isomer is teratogenic. So, here we, uh, which uh, you have to find out which statement regarding the drug thalidomide is true. Now, here I, uh, I have said you like this co course is medicinal chemistry, but we did uh, learn a lot of the stereochemistry today also. And uh, this is the reason actually why we need to take care of stereochemistry while uh, studying medicinal chemistry or studying uh, about the drugs. Uh, so, here we uh, this is the question where we can uh, we will clearly understand uh, understand this thing. So, anybody wants to answer this question? We have only one answer till now, which, which is called D. Okay, let's discuss it. Okay, so the correct answer is A. The R isomer is actually sedative. So, what is sedative and what is teratogenic? So, uh, you can see this is the R thalidomide. And this is the S thalidomide. Okay, so this th uh, this is the R and S mixture of a thalidomide. So, the thalidomide actually uh, it was um, uh, meant as a slipping aid, but uh, prescribed to the um, uh, pregnant woman to um, treat the um, anxiety and nausea. Okay, the drug caused serious birth abnormalities for hundred of the children. Okay, uh, and uh, this actually uh, this is of uh, something is called the thalidomide disaster. It is very uh, famous thing in the medicinal chemistry. You can just search in the internet and you can read about it. What is the thalidomide disaster? So actually. Uh, you before uh, this is actually pretty uh, in back in 90s okay so what happened like this drug thalidomide it was uh, given to the uh, pregnant uh, woman for the morning sickness uh, but uh, it was not actually uh, it was a racemic mixture that so the drugs which were uh, given as you can see there is two isomers the r isomer and s isomer for the same drug okay so uh, before uh, the people do, do not have the uh, concept of this uh, this much concept of the chirality and stereochemistry related with the medicinal chemistry so this drug was given as a uh, racemic mixture okay so what happened like this uh, two isomers they are similar in everything only the spatial arrangement is different one is r one is s but the before because of this r and s uh, difference the whole uh, i mean the uh, nature of this molecule the effect which is present is completely different so this r isomer is a, it is a sedative which is meant to be i mean the drugs are uh, the drug was administrative to meant to be the sedative but this s isomer 
uh, which is it is teratogenic. So, the teratogenic means uh, like it uh, teratogenic this term actually means like it will uh, give something defective ok, it will produce a defective uh, response. So, because it is given to the uh, mothers of the um, uh, who will be uh, who have the fetus. So, this um, S isomer have this uh, teratogenic effect on the fetus and as you can see the there was the birth abnormality. So, a large number of babies which were uh, uh, given birth at that time which have this uh, particular uh, this kind of abnormalities um, of their limbs and everything. So, this is called the thalidomide uh, disaster. So, that is why we have to take care of the stereochemistry while designing a drug while reading the stereochemistry because same molecule which have only a, a one carbon difference for the stereochemistry can produce a huge uh, I mean different uh, response in the uh, in our human body ok. Ok, so I think it is clear we will move toward our next problem. So, problem number 10 it says that when an, uh, an agonist binds to the receptor for a long period of time it can result in phosphorylation reaction occurring. So, which of the following term is most relevant description of the immediate effect? Number A tolerance, number B dependence, number C sensitization and number D desensitization. So, when an agonist binds to a receptor for a long period of time it can result in phosphorylation reaction occurring. Which of the following term is the most relevant description of the immediate effect? Okay, so, do somebody wants to say anything? Okay, we have the options. Okay, desensitization somebody says. Okay, we will just see what is the correct answer. Okay, so yes, it is it is called the desensitization. So, the desensitization uh, can be a result of a temporary inaccessibility of the receptor to the agonist. So, if the agonist is uh, binding uh, with the receptor for a long period of time, it can uh, actually result in the phosphorylation reaction and this will uh, lead to the temporary inaccessibility of the receptor to the agonist or it is a result of the fewer receptors synthesized and available at the cell surface. Down regulation of uh, the receptor uh, describes, describes the point too and the, um, for example, the agon agonist sim uh, stimulation of GPCRs initially produces rapid response, but uh, subsequent stimulation by agonist uh, lead to the desensitization of the receptor. So, systemic desensitization also known as the graduated exposure therapy is a type of behavior therapy is used in the field of the psychology or to help effectively to overcome other anxiety disorder ok. So, this is something different. Uh, so, you just uh, remember this term desensitization. So, when the agonist bind to the receptor for a long period of time it uh, leads to the phosphorylation reaction and this is the term desensitization. Um, so, it is the uh, used to describe this immediate effect. So, we will uh, quickly move toward our next problems. Okay, so, this is our problem number 11 and uh, it says that if the connectivity of the atoms are different in isomers, they are called you have 4 options. So, option number A is configurational isomers, option B is conformational isomers, option C is constitutional isomers and option D is stereo isomers ok. So, at this point I will just give you 2 to 3 minutes break ok. So, you try to solve this question and uh, try to take a break also while solving this. I think there is nothing much of this uh, question. So, uh, this is uh, to, uh, the time is 7 7. So, ok. So, we have one answer 11 is C. So, we will see it. So, just uh, take a break for 2 minutes and try to solve this question. I will join just after 2 minutes uh, and uh, then we will solve the rest of the questions ok.
okay so uh, i have joined again so welcome back so yeah we have two options answers so i think my voice is uh, audible okay so uh, and uh, the video is visible so can you just uh, hear me just confirm in the chat box if my voice is audible okay yeah thank you so okay so we have two uh, answers and uh, the answer is same actually number c so let's say the answer number c says that uh, constitutional isomers so yeah it is the correct the correct answer is the constitutional isomers okay so let's uh, see what are the things okay so uh, there are two things no, there are very different terms so one term is called the uh, one two terms are called the configuration conformation and two terms i will just like to discuss are stereoisomers and constitutional isomers so isomer are uh, the compounds that contain the same atoms bonded together in different ways okay if the connectivity in the two isomers are different so they are called the uh, constitutional isomers but uh, if the connectivity of uh, the atoms is the two isomers is the same so they are called the stereoisomer so enantiomers diastereomers so these are the stereoisomers mm, okay and uh, these types we will just uh, will see later so con uh, constitutional isomers are uh, basically the uh, depends on the connectivity how the molecules are connected so as you can see if in this first uh, picture or the first uh, structure so as you can see the with the carbons two carbons there are r group the oh group and cn group so in this both carbon uh, both molecules the groups are same but the bonds are connected differently okay so the cyan uh, the cyano group it is uh, connected with this carbon here and this carbon here and so although this um, compounds the all atoms are same the these are connected with a different way so these are the constitutional isomers so the way the atoms are connected up so that differs and this is called the stereo isomers so stereo isomers like uh, enantiomer ez isomers okay so the, the their connectivity is the same but it is arranged difficult um, differently uh, in the 3d or in the 2d it, they are arranged differently but the connectivity of same so as you can see here uh, the r group and the cyano group these are connected to this carbon and this carbon okay and this uh, groups are also connected to the the connection is same the bonds are kind connected samely but the rotation or the representations are different in the 3d and in the 2d okay and so these are called the isomers or stereo isomers and for the conformation and configuration so these two terms uh, if you see that the changing the configuration of a molecule always means like the bonds are broken okay now, so like two configuration uh, like you can see here the two configurations going from one enantiomer to another another it will require the bond breakage okay and uh, this two both of these two you can see and uh, if there are uh, a different configuration means a different molecule and changing the conformation of a molecule means rotating the bonds not breaking them and configuration of uh, conformation of the molecule are readily interconvertible so these are the they are the same molecule so if you can see if this is one molecule and this is if you rotate this bond it will be other representation and it will be other representation so these three are the same uh, conf three conformation of the conformation of the same enantiomer getting one and other it will just rotation of the molecule then configuration are like the molecule the bonds are broken okay so these are the four terms which are very important and uh, how what each uh, every term means so this is like this okay now i will move toward our next problem so problem number 12 it says that what which are um, uh, what are the terms in the alpha and d represent in this uh, representation so what is alpha and what is d number a option specific rotation and d, d for density option b alpha for specific rotation and uh, d for 589 nanometer wavelength option c alpha means specific absorbance and d for 589 nanometer wavelength and uh, an option d alpha for total rotation and d for density now you have to figure out in this uh, alpha d this representation which one is uh, what alpha signifies and what what d signifies try to answer this in the chat box there somebody answered this let us let me check 
okay number b and uh, number c somebody says b and somebody says c so we have two different contradictory answers somebody again we have another answer number b okay let's see So correct answer is yes it is number B specific rotation and 589 nanometer wavelength. So okay. So the rotation of plane polarized light is known as the optical activity. Now all of these things like you know the there is a R isomer, there is a S isomer, there is a positive rotation, there is a negative rotation. Every time there is a number, a specific a rota a term of the number in the degrees it is mentioned, which is called the opti optical specific rotation, okay, or the total rotation. So observation of rotation of the plane polarized right, it is called the polarimetry. This is a polarimeter uh, instrument, you can say. And so it is a straight uh, straightforward way of finding out if a sample is racemic or if it contains more mm, of one enantiomer okay It'll be better it contains uh, one or more enantiomer than the other so polarimeter measurements uh, polarimetric measurements are carried out in a polarimeter which has a single wavelength monochromatic light source uh, which is placed um, with the plane polarizing filter a sample holder where the cell containing a solution of a substance under the examination can be placed and a detector uh, with a readout indicates how much of the light is rotated rotation to the right side it indicates positive value and rotation to the left it indicates the negative value so there in this polarimeter there is a sodium lamp here okay and this alpha wavelength which is uh, d mentioned here it is a 589 nanometer which is the d line of the sodium uh, line okay so is this zero percent polarization so after the light passes through the solution containing the uh, containing a compound the concentration given in the gram uh, per semi cube okay and the cell length is l in decimeter uh, so and the, we will get the detector where we can measure this rotation which is the alpha okay so the angle through which the sample of the compound usually the solution rotates the plane polarized light depend upon the number of factors the most important ones being the path length how far the light has passed through the solution concentration temperature solvent wavelength etc so typically optical rotations are measured um, at 20 degrees centigrade uh, in a solvent such as ethanol or chloroform and the light uh, used is measured in the sodium lamp which has the wavelength of 589 nanometer so the observed angle through which the light rotated given below by the sample of alpha so by dividing this value the, the path length in decimeter and the concentration c in gram per cc we get a value like alpha which is specific to the compound in the question so indeed alpha is known as the compound specific rotation the choice of units is, uh, is eccentric and arbitrary but it is universal uh, so we we must live with it okay so this is alpha it is by alpha total rotation by c the concentration so this is alpha in the third bracket it is called the specific rotation okay so uh, it's a, uh, the specific rotation of the d, d indicates the wavelength 589 nanometer the d line of the sodium and 20 if there is a 20 uh, in, the, in the superscript it indicates the 20 degree temperature okay so this is all about the you know, rotation of a plane polarized light and all these things and this formula is very important we will try to solve one numerical based on this formula uh, so do you did you understood this part okay so if you have any query of this optical rotation and anything you didn't understand you should tell me here because after that we will solve a numerical based on this thing okay so i think it is more or less clear so anyway i will share this ppts with you also and uh, you can read it uh, later also about this all after optical rotation and everything so quickly move toward this numerical which is problem number three it says that when a 28 mg com enantiomerically pure mandelic acid dissolved in, uh, in one uh, se semi cube methanol a solution a solution of methanol and the solution is placed in the 10 semi long polarimeter an optical rotation of minus 4.35 degrees observed at 20 degrees centigrade now calculate the specific rotation so your options are like this number a minus 15.54 or number b plus 155.4 number c minus 155.4 and number d plus 15.54 try to use the formula we uh, saw last uh, in last uh, slide which is this 
alpha equal to alpha by c and you have to take care of the units also like uh, the concentration in gram per cc and the cell length l is uh, in decimeter okay so try to do this math and tell me what is what should be the answer anyway i will just uh, solve it for you also so but uh, first you try to do it yourself So anybody did this uh, problem? Do we have any answer? Okay, we have one answer which says minus 55.1, 55.4. So let's see if it is the correct answer or not. Okay. So I will show you. So yes, it is correct. Number answer correct is number C minus 155.4. So this is the solve. Okay. So like the I have said like you have to take care of the units very carefully okay so first we need to convert the concentration to grams per cc okay so we have 28 milligram in one semi cube which means 0 0.028 gram per cc and the length path length is uh, 10 centimeter means one decimeter okay so uh, here you can see alpha is given the total rotation was minus 4.35 and you just need to divide it by c and uh, your uh, cell length which is your uh, so the concentration is 0 0.028 in gram per cc and the path length is 10 centimeter here means 1 decimeter so it will be multiplied by 1 so it will be the answer if the path length was something different see it if it was like uh, 20 centimeter so it will be 2 decimeter then it you have to multiply this uh, new denominator by 2 okay so this is also this formula is uh, can be written like this okay so it also written like uh, alpha divided by c into l and this l is the cell length uh, with the decimeter in unit so this is very important like the cell length this uh, unit of the cell length and this concentration like you have to take the concentration in gram per cc and the cell length is decimeter so be careful with these two units I think somebody wants to join. Okay, so look at uh, the answer, the problem carefully and tell me if you do not uh, understand uh, anything about uh, this thing. If you have not understood anything, I will repeat it. Okay, but I think this uh, problem was uh, more or less very easier. So, this sign is very important since the total rotation. Uh, the optical rotation observed was min the minus sign so the answer total answer it will be also minus so this plus minus sign this also this is the movement is positive direction or negative direction so this is all about so i will move toward our next problem okay so the problem number 40 it says that when binding data is analyzed in that uh, 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 scattered plot slope is used to estimate dash and x inter x axis intercept is used to estimate dash and you have to find out which is uh, slow what is the slope is used to estimate and what is the uh, thing which is used uh, which is uh, is estimated by x axis intercept okay so options are like this option a kd and rate of dissociation option b rate of dissociation and kd option c binding stoichiometry and kd and option d kd and binding stoichiometry try to answer this and then we will discuss about this plot and how what is this things all about okay so when the binding data is analyzed in this scattered plot 
the slope is used to estimate what and the x axis uh, intercept is used to estimate what. For number 14, do we have any answers? Okay, we have. Okay, won't we take the concentration of the acid? Yes, we are taking the concentration of the acid. So, in that problem, I said that this uh, acid is dissolved in the solution. So, this acid is basically the solid acid, okay. And we are dissolving this acid in the so methanol solution. So, the concentration, that is how the concentration comes. This concentration which is given, it is the concentration of the acid, right. We are taking the concentration of the acid. The acid, it is not a liquid acid like uh, you know hydrochloric acid or sulfuric acid anything. So, mandelic acid is solid, uh, indeed solid acid, okay. So, this solid is uh, dissolved in the liquid in the methanol and we have to take the concentration of that methanol solution where the acid is dissolved, okay. So, basically it is the concentration of the acid, okay. So, no, not a mole per liter, we will take the concentration in gram per liter. So, that is uh, what I have said uh, when we were discussing this optical rotation, when you are uh, uh, just uh, doing this optical rotation thing, the concentration is always taken as I have said here also, the concentration is always taken in the, uh, I mean uh, gram per cc thing, okay. We do not take the mole per liter thing of here. That depends to formula or formula, but this formula particularly takes care of it in the gram per cc. Okay, so we will move toward our uh, the problem which we were discussing now problem number 14. So yeah, the correct answer is number D. The binding data analyzed is scattered for the slope is used to estimate the KD and the x axis intercept is used to estimate the binding stoichiometry. So this is uh, this is something which is called the scattered plot. Okay, so there is a total number of receptor which is present. It is equal to number of receptor occupied by the ligand, so which is given by LR. So receptor, as we know, and the ligand, which are con co which can be the agonist molecules in that sense. So, uh, so there is a receptor ligand complex, and those which are unoccupied, which can be given by R. So there are two terms. Okay, one there are receptors which is binding to the ligand, which is given by this LR, and another which is unoccupied receptor, which is R. So bound ligand and free ligand. Uh, so, the, uh, there is a stoichiometry which is LR by L. And so, this uh, bound ligand LR it can be given by total uh, uh, total R minus LR okay. and this is the KD. So, from this thing the KD comes like this L into R by LR. Okay. This means the number of receptor by unoccupied by the ligand is R which is R total minus LR. Okay. So, R total minus LR which can be given by R this only the R which is unoccupied ligand and this KD is the formula is generated. Okay. So, however, these terms can be determined by drawing a graph based on the numbers of experiment where different concentration of a known radio ligand is used. So, this LR and L these are measured in each case in the scattered plot is drawn and compares the ratio of LR by L versus LR. So, LR by L versus LR if you plot this thing, so this will give us a straight line. Okay. So, from this straight line, uh, the x axis intercept this uh, gives us the uh, point where it is a total number of receptors that are available means the binding stoichiometry and the slope it is the measure of the radio ligands affinity for the receptor that allows us to uh, determine the, uh, the KD. Okay. So, this thing is a little different from what we were discussing for till now. Also, this about this plot and everything. So, just uh, you have to read it uh, carefully. And uh, this is a very uh, easy actually thing to calculate this thing, but you have to read it once uh, otherwise it is it will look like a little problematic. So, basically this terms if you just uh, calculate it and for the number of experiment we have to do. So, this ligand we take some radio ligand for which uh, we can just uh, have some values okay. and uh, then we just uh, plot this kind of graph with the uh, different points and from the slope we get this uh, KD and uh, from the intercept, uh, our x axis intercept, we get this binding stoichiometry. 
okay so it was all about the scattered plot we will quickly move toward our problem number 15 now okay so problem number 15 it says that separation of enantiomer can be done by and the options are crystallization number b chiral chromatography number c lcms and number d it is not possible so you have to find out that the separation of the enantiomer can be done by uh, these three methods or it cannot be done so do you have any answer for problem number 15 okay we have one answer i think now we have two to three answers like chiral chromatography okay so let us see the, which is the answer and then discuss it so yeah the correct answer is number b chiral chromatography now what is chiral chromatography so in general what is chromatography so chromatography is what we know like um, there is a stationary phase and there will be a mobile phase in the chromatography okay so mainly the most used chromatography in our organic chemistry is is the column chromatography so there the stationary phase is the silica gel silica gel is the fine silica particle and uh, the mobile phase is the solvent uh, which is travels uh, to the stationary phase which is called the eluent okay and uh, then uh, the solvent which uh, there is a there is a silica which is stationary phase and we have to take the compounds in a solution phase with the solvent which is the eluent and we have to just pour the solvent over the silica and separate it in a column okay so like this is uh, this is okay, this is the column so there is silica by is their presence is here okay and we just add the mixture of uh, two different racemic uh, compound not racemic any compound mixture we can just pour it here and depend on the affinity of that compound toward the silica gel toward the column so we just uh, have the separations okay uh, so interactions even weaker than ionic bonds can be used to separate enantiomers chromatographic separation relies on the difference in the affinity between the stationary phase and the mobile phase and the solvent traveling through the stationary phase known as the eluent mediated for by for example hydrogen bonds or van der Waals interaction and if the stationary phase is made uh, chiral by bonding it with an uh, enantiomerically pure compound often a derivative of the amino acid in chromatography can be uh, used to separate the enantiomer okay so if the say the, so there is a normal silica as you can see this is normal silica okay and norm, for normal compound which is not chiral compound and we don't need to do the separation of the enantiomer we use this normal silica but if there is a need for the separation of a chiral compounds like two different enantiomer like r enantiomer s enantiomers from the column then what we need to do it we need to modify this silica okay and uh, we have to make this silica chiral so since the silica is achiral but when we used uh, a, um, an enantiomerically pure compound often derivative of amino acid like this this is a derivative of amino acid which is used to make the silica chiral here okay now what will happen you just pack this column with this chiral silica and this racemic mixture in a solution is poured over this silica and the compound is forced through the column using a eluent okay now what will happen like if the, the enantiomer see from this picture the S enantiomer has a greater affinity with the chiral stationary phase so it travels more slowly means it binds to the silica more strongly than this R enantiomer so what will happen if you just keep pouring the solvent the R enantiomer will leave the column first and it is separated and collected and the S enantiomer it will be separated later okay so this is for the chiral compounds for, for normal uh, chromatography what happens we use the uh, use the change of the polarity to separate a compound okay so if there are two compounds one is more polar one is less polar so silica is the polar okay silica gel is the polar uh, polar thing so what happens if the compound uh, which is uh, polar more so it will bind the silica more strongly and the compound which is non-polar which uh, so the polar compound will be like uh, bind uh, to the silica here okay and the non-polar compound which will be binding to the silica which will not bind to silica much affinitively and which will be traveling uh, fast okay so when you are uh, pouring the solvent we first you will get the normal the normal uh, non-polar compound and later on when you increase the polarity of the eluent we will get the polar compound okay now the this is the solution which we you pour in the uh, column chromatography it also changes in the concentration like uh, so if the, you just we just uh, ch take a mixture of a solvent 
So, for the column chromatography when we do it, so we um, actually uh, use a mixture of the polar and non-polar solvent. Okay, like ethyl acetate petetha we can use where the ethyl acetate is the polar solvent and petroleum ether is the non-polar solvent. Or for the higher polarity we use the dichloromethane DCM and methanol where the methanol is the more polar and dichloromethane it is the non-polar okay for with respect to the methanol. So, what happen like in the we make the different percentage of the solution okay. So, like uh, for say ethyl acetate and petroleum ether we make 5 percent, we make 10 percent, 20 percent and this percentage means 5 percent ethyl acetate pet ether means there will be 5 percent of the uh, ethyl acetate and 95 percent of the petroleum ether. So, when there is a percentage mentioned in a solution of the eluent the percentage is uh, with respect to the polar solvent like in the DCM methanol 5 percent DCM methanol means 5 percent methanol used and 95 percent of DCM used because methanol is more polar than the DCM or methanol chloroform. The methanol is more polar so 5 percent chloroform methanol means 5 percent of methanol and 95 percent of chloroform and we subsequently increase the percentage. So, if the compound is non-polar so, it will come out in more non-polar solvent okay means uh, 5 percent ethyl acetate pet ether mixture is enough to remove this non-polar compound. But the compound if the compound is binding strongly with the silica then we have to increase the percentage of our eluent so that the compound get dissolved in the station uh, mobile phase and comes out okay. And for the chiral chromatography the thing is same okay the how the these things are uh, uh, separated. So, if the R enantiomer it is binding less strongly with the silica. So, if you use uh, like 5 percent uh, polar solvent and 95 percent non-polar solvent this R isomer can be obtained. But if you increase the um, increase the percentage for this isomer which is binding more strongly you have to increase the percentage like 25 percent let us say of the non-polar and polar solvent mixture ok. And which percentage by uh, we will use how you do you know? Now, which percentage do you have to use to uh, to just uh, remove this uh, to get this separate this enantiomer that uh, information you will get by the uh, TLC the thin layer chromatography ok. So, this is uh, something different and uh, I do not know if you guys know about this uh, chromatography and thing, but I pretty much show that uh, you do not have some hand on experience. Okay, so their option uh, option A and C can be used to separate the same enantiomer, and uh, okay, so one enantiomer crystal remain the solution. Okay, so that is not a way uh, how which uh, can separate it. Okay, so yeah, it may happen like um, one uh, which, uh, one thing crystallize and another uh, does not crystallize. So in by that method we cannot separate it properly. Okay, so they, if uh, one enantiomer get crystallized and another enantiomer uh, stays in the solution, so first thing that uh, separation would not be much more efficient like the chiral chromatography ok. Because it is not possible like one enantiomer crystallize and other remains in solution completely 100 percent ok. There will be something some uh, there can be co-crystals like two enantiomer can form same crystal. Say I have a so R isomer crystallized but S isomer does not crystallize. But there can be some co-crystals of the S isomers with the R isomers also. So, the purity will not be 100 percent just like the chiral chromatography. Same goes for the LCMS ok. So, these things are uh, because of the LCMS the for the technique that takes care of uh, using the mass ok and the isomers they will have the same mass as you I have just uh, mentioned it before like it will be have same mass. So, by using LCMS it is uh, not much possible because you have to use chiral silica for the, your uh, separation of enantiomers. Otherwise two if you do not use in LCMS if you do not use uh, we do not use chiral silica ok. So, if you do not use chiral silica what will happen like this two enantiomer will will not bind uh, differently in this column. They will bind in the same place and they will come out with the same ok. So, that is why this is not possible. So, no uh, high profile liquid chromatography and LCMS these two are something different ok. The, uh, the basics of the things are different. Uh, we will uh, discuss it later someday because today we do not have that much time. So, LCMS actually um, uh, takes care of the mass ok. We, uh, we have to see the mass and from the mass you have to separate it. But HPLC I do not think it is uh, I do not have the hand on experience of, of uh, HPLC. So, I am not sure about it. So, I will look into it and I will give you detail about this both two separation technique in the next class ok.
and I think you understood what is chiral chromatography okay so did you understood it or not what is chiral chromatography and what is column okay fine okay so uh, about that I will just take care of it at the next day okay so quickly we will go to the problem number 16 so you have to identify the incorrect statement among the following okay so number a it says that estradiol is a carbon rich steroid having four dings number b metabolite of tamoxifen uh, is the antagonist of estradiol number c tamoxifen is the antagonist of estradiol number d both of the tamoxifen and its metabolites are the agonist of the estradiol so you have to find out which is the incorrect statement among the following Do you have any answer for this? Okay. Okay, so I think I did a mistake in this options. Okay, so there may be two incorrect options. So look at carefully. So I think there are two incorrect statements about this problem. Okay, I think I did some mistake. So anyway so you can say any of uh, the which is you say you think is the incorrect answer that there may be two incorrect statements in this question okay i will just show you the answer of that question okay it is given b the metabolite of tamoxifen is the uh, is an agonist of okay I have some uh, error here okay one second it will be antagonist okay so actually uh, in this question uh, I did a mistake because uh, the two options are incorrect here okay so this is the estradiol this is tamoxifen and this is metabolite of tamoxifen so the number one so uh, let's go, go one by one then I can just uh, explain it better so estradiol is a carbon rich steroid having four rings which is correct okay this is a estradiol structure it has four rings this is one ring a this is ring b this is ring c and this is ring d so estradiol has four rings okay and it is carbon rich steroid okay so number b it says metabolite okay so let's see first the number c so tamoxifen is the antagonist of estradiol it is also correct so this is the structure of this tamoxifen molecule and it is the antagonist of the estradiol okay now option b it says that metabolite of tamoxifen is the antagonist of estradiol which is incorrect so this is the metabolite of the tamoxifen but it is the agonist of uh, estradiol okay which is agonist it is not antagonist so in the if it is uh, it, it is antagonist okay it uh, tamoxifen is antagonist of the estradiol but it is the its uh, metabolite is the agonist of the estradiol so your number d option it is also incorrect because uh, the uh, both of the tamoxifen and its metabolite are uh, agonist of estradiol so it is incorrect so i will just uh, correct it okay so because uh, also the number option number your d is also incorrect I will just rewrite it otherwise you will later when I share this PPT you will be get confused okay so this is the thing so both are the answers are the incorrect the number B and D so it is the estradiol which is a steroid this tamoxifen it is a molecule which actually is antagonist with the estradiol but the metabolite of the tamoxifen which is this molecule this metabolite has this phenolic group here and this OH here and this molecule actually mimics the estradiol that's why it is the agonist of the estradiol so you have to remember estradiol tamoxifen is uh, the ag antagonist but the metabolite of tamoxifen it is the agonist for the estradiol okay so that's why number B and number D both are incorrect okay I think it is uh, now it is understandable because uh, it was some printing mistake so I just uh, 
corrected it because two statements are incorrect. Okay. So, I will move toward our next problem. So, problem number 7 is very easy and I want everybody to answer this. So, all the chiral amino acids have absolute configuration of S except 1. Which amino acid shows this exception? Number A lysine, number B phenylalanine, number C valine and number D cysteine. So, you all know that every chiral amino acid have the absolute configuration of X plus 1 is uh, actually have R, configure, um, R uh, absolute configuration. So, you have to identify which amino acid have this R configuration. So, let us see, okay, only one answer is D. So, I want everybody to try this because it is very easy I think, okay, you may not answer this, okay, that is fine, I will explain it. Okay, so the correct uh, answer is yes, number D cysteine. So, you can see this is the absolute configuration, okay, so for the normal amino acids what happened? So, for uh, this you see this is the number one priority which is the amine group because nitrogen has higher priority. Then the second priority so maximum cases when so this is a basic structure of the amino acid ok. So, this is for except every amino acid except uh, your uh, cysteine have this kind of this R can represent anything any group ok for other amino acid there is the carboxylic acid there is the NH2 and there is in the dash form which are hydrogen. So, for normal amino acids everything uh, except the your other amino acid except your cysteine what happens like this gets this amine group gets the priority number 1, this carboxylate group it, it gets the priority number 2 ok. Because we have car with carbon we have 2 oxygen atoms and this R group it has the priority number 3. So, it generally uh, goes from 1, 2 to 3. So, this is anti clockwise means S configuration ok. Now, for cysteine what happens we have sulfur here ok. If you look carefully here sulfur here and you know that in the group oxygen then comes the sulfur downward. So, sulfur has the higher molecular weight. So, it has the higher priority which is priority number 2 then carboxylic group which has the priority number 3. So, it goes 1, 2 and 3 and it is clockwise. So, it is R configuration ok. So, did you understand why it is R and why the normal amino acids are S? Okay. Okay. So, I think I will just move. Okay. If you have any doubt, so please read in write in the chat box. Otherwise, I will just go to the next problem because we have less much time now. So, okay. Number 18, it says that which of the following conformation for the cyclohexane is most unstable? Options are number A, chair. Option B true boat, option C half chair and option D twist boat. We did read about something about cyclohexane in the previous slides ok and it is related to that to cyclohexane part. So, you have to identify which of the following is most unstable. So, do we have any answers? Yes, so I will just check the chat box once. Okay, we have one answer which says B. Okay, let us see. Okay, I will just quickly show you because we do not have much time today. Okay, the correct answer is C. The half chair form is most unstable. Now, this is the energy profile, the uh, energy diagram, energy uh, profile of the cyclohexane. Okay, and this is the conformational change during the inversion of cyclohexane. So, this is the chair form and if you invert this chair it will be like this chair B. So, both of these have chairs have the same energy and if you uh, say relative energies is 0. 
no, it is not zero it is the relative energy okay not the absolute energy so then uh, from the inversion it goes to this forms okay the, so first it goes to the half chair so this half chair from it has the most uh, high energy so it is most unstable okay then from the half chair we have this twist board configuration okay this twist board conformation goes to a true board and this true board is it is a intermediate okay and this true board after this true board uh, conformation we has the ha have this twist board again and then it goes to the half chair again and then chair so you just remember how this uh, curves look like and what is the name of the each and every uh, formation and how this happens how this uh, this is a very uh, detailed thing and which is not a scope of our syllabus but uh, still i thought it will be good to have you uh, know about little bit of the stereochemistry also and anyway i have said that i will suggest you some books of the stereochemistry from there we can read it so the half chair form uh, it is the most unstable as you can see from this energy profile diagram okay quickly uh, we have two more questions left today so quickly we will go to it so problem number 19 it says that which of the uh, which is the most uns uh, which is the most stable conformer uh, for the cis 1 to di uh, tertiary butyl cyclohexane which is the most stable conformer and options are number a boat option b chair option c half chair and option c option d twist boat you have to find out which is the most stable conformer for the cis 1 4 di cyclo di tertiary butyl cyclohexane here you have to substituent okay so you try to uh, you have to take care of the substituent also anyways i will show you i think so the correct answer for this is number c twist boat so now you may think that twist boat i have in the previous i have said that twist boat uh, first the chair is most stable then the twist boat now in this case the twist boat is the most stable now why because as you can see so this is your structure of cis 1 for di tertiary butyl cyclohexane okay and it says that an action so if you see if you keep it in the chair form what will happen one tertiary butyl group will be in the axial formation okay now this axial tertiary butyl group is very uncomfortable in the cis 1 for di tertiary butyl cyclohexane once uh, tertiary butyl would be forced to have axial if the compound existed in the chair configuration and to uh, avoid this what will happen the compound prefers to, a, uh, prefers to pucker the uh, twist board uh, and so that the two large group can be in the uh, pseudo equatorial position since it is uh, it is called pseudo equatorial since it is not a chair so it is a twist board so what will happen if this compound stays in the most stable chair form this will have this uh, tertiary butyl group in the axial position which will uh, destabilize this molecule because this large groups actually tend to prefer in the equatorial position okay and if you keep one equator since one or two they are uh, cis in you have to keep them cis so two you cannot keep in the uh, equatorial okay so that is why what happens to make it more stabilized it uh, takes up the conformation of the twist board so that this uh, this two groups can be in the equatorial or pseudo equatorial position okay now the last question i will just show you so the last question it says for the molecule having dissimilar chirality center the number of optical isomers is 2 to the power n minus 1 2 to the power n 2 to the power n minus 1 by 2 and number d is 0 so actually what is the number of the this uh, optical isomers there are few formulas and uh, i will suggest you if you can uh, remove, remember this formulas it will be better okay So anybody wants to answer number 20, question number 20, okay we have answers like B, okay let us see, okay yes the correct answer is number B. So prediction of the number of stereo isomer that is the number of optical isomers and uh, mesoforms, so it depends upon the following, so one number of chirality centers which is small n and number two whether the chirality centers are similar or dissimilar so for the molecule having dissimilar chirality centers the number of optical isomer is 2 to the power n and the number of mesoforms is 0 for molecules having similar chirality centers so these molecules are of two types so a molecules having even number of chiral carbon and molecules having odd number of chiral carbon 
and for molecule having even number of chiral centers optical isomers will be 2 to the power n minus 1 and meso compounds will be 2 to the power n minus 2 by 1 and for compounds having odd number of chiral centers number of optical isomer is 2 to the power n minus 1 or 2 to the power n minus 1 minus 2 to the power n minus 1 by 2 and number of meso form is 2 to the power n 2 to the power minus 1 n minus 1 by 2. So, these formulas I think if you uh, can remember it will be better for you if you can remember I if you do not need this thing uh, much in much detail in your know, this course it may be needed to for your stereochemistry courses ok. So, this is it. So, thank you for you to join this class I think uh, you guys understood this things ok. So, few quick things I have said uh, like I will just uh, tell you about some books. Uh, so, you can uh, just uh, take a look in the organic chemistry by uh, Claydon. So, it is a very classical book of organic chemistry you can uh, read uh, the stereochemistry part from this book also ok and one more thing uh, one more book like stereo chemistry uh, by uh, D Nashipuri ok. So, D Nashipuri. So, the structure about the I have everything about this uh, stereo isomer the uh, chair form cyclohexane these things how to uh, see the RS uh, nomenclature in different forms how to convert Fisher to Newman these things are you can read more detail from the stereochemistry of Dina Shipuri and the things we discussed today many things were from this book Leiden. So, you can just uh, take care of this all stuff from these two books ok. So, anyways I think uh, these videos are being uh, communicated to you from the uh, NBTL website. So, this uh, today's lecture video and everything will be uh, communicated to you soon and the uh, PDP, uh, PPT also. So, that was it, it was the week 4 uh, your today's week 3 lives interaction session where we discussed about week 4 lecture materials. For next Saturday we will discuss uh, the week 5 lecture materials and uh, I think you guys uh, understood everything. So, yeah thank you for joining today and I hope you will join in the next session uh, also. And so, I will uh, see you in the next class and the questions which were raised today which I did not uh, I did not answer I will try to answer that questions in the next day ok. So, thank you all for joining I will just uh, end the call for today. So, see you in the next Saturday every Saturday we have will have this kind of class from 6 pm to 8 pm ok. So, thank you so much.